you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus 14, Exodus chapter 14. And I'm going to be brief today. Somebody's like, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Um, and I believe that for many that are here today, this message will show you a way out of a seemingly impossible situation that you may be facing. Exodus 14, verse 9, we're taking a look at, many of us know the story of Moses. Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, let my people go, let God's people go. They had been slaves for generations to the Egyptians. And God came in a burning bush to Moses and said, Moses, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to Pharaoh and tell him that my people need to be let go. And so Moses goes to Pharaoh, he puts plagues on Egypt, and Pharaoh's finally like, take your people and get out of here. So God's people finally leave, and then a little bit later, Pharaoh wakes up, and he's like, oh no, there goes my cheap labor. Oh no, there goes all these people that can do work for me, and so I'm not going to be okay with that. And so he gets his army together, and he sends them after God's people. So he goes back on his offer to let God's people go. And this is where we pick up the story. It said, so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside that place and that other place. If you're looking for fancy, you've come to the wrong place. If you know how to pronounce it, we will give you a certificate with a gold star next to it. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, their pastor, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians as slaves than that we should die in the wilderness. Here we have people complaining to their pastor, which never happens. Somebody say amen. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. Isn't that a good promise? The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I want to talk to you today on the subject, the king has one more move. The king has one more move. How many of you in here are chess players? Any, any chess players in, in the room? Any chess players? I mean, just by a show of hands. If you just raised your hand, you are a nerd. I just need to let you know that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I grew up, my, my dad, and he's, he's, he's watching here, my dad was a principal, so whenever my dad got games in the house, it wasn't something like sorry or trouble. It was like educational games, right? So dad was like, you boys are going to learn chess. And so me and my brother would play chess against each other. Now, my brother is a great chess player. And he's my older brother. He's very, very good at chess. My brother is a thinker. He's a strategizer. I'm just super competitive, Okay, I'm the person that doesn't read the instructions. I'm the person that doesn't care about the instructions. I don't care about any of that. I just want to win. So anything that I can do to win. I'm the classic little brother that once I start to feel like I'm not going to win, I find a way to win even if I lose. Does anyone know what I'm saying? And so I'll just, I'll just start treating chess like checkers if I feel like I'm losing. I'll just start to just say, king me. And my brother's like, that, that's not, that doesn't exist in chess. And I'm like, well, it does now. And then I flip over the chess board and I'm done. And I won. Does it, get, does it get like almost violent in your household when you play Monopoly? Does anybody, you know that if you're playing Uno, someone is going to get stabbed in your house. 
I, I don't know if anybody is like this, but I've just learned being in Texas long enough that everything's bigger in Texas because Texans are competitive. And so, and so, and so, so but chess is, is interesting. Chess is a game of strategy. Many times, uh, chess, you are thinking not just your next move, but you're thinking your next 10 moves. And so chess is a game where you have to outwit your opponent. You have to out-strategize one another. And so the pieces move in very particular ways. And when you look at the chessboard, if you don't know how to play chess, I'm going to show you. So these pieces here on the front, they're called the pawns. And pawns can move just one space, and they attack diagonally. Then you have your rooks back here, and your rooks can, can move this way at the perpendiculars and this way, 90-degree angles, okay? Then you have your knights, and they can move two up and to the left or to the right. Then you have your bishops, and they can move on the diagonals only. Bishops move diagonally. They can slide. They don't just move one space. They can slide. Then you have the queen, and the queen moves however she wants to move. Because, <laughs> you know, somebody designed chess with the queen in mind. They just knew. They're like, what are we going to do with the queen? They just said, just, just let her do whatever she wants to do. Because in my household, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And if daddy ain't happy, nobody cares. Okay? That's just how it goes. That's just a life lesson. It's in uh, the book of um, uh, Ecclesiastes. Look it up. And then, and so, but then you have the king. Now, the king can move one space. The king can move forward. He can move diagonal forward, diagonal back. But he can only move one. And the whole point of chess, the whole game of chess, is to advance your pieces on the other player. And your number one goal is to surround the king. Surround your opponent's king to where he moves forward, you've got him. Or if he moves diagonal, you've got him. If he moves back, you've got him. If he moves to the left, you've got him. If he moves to the right, you've got him. And finally, if you beat your opponent in chess, you get to say an unbelievable phrase to your opponent. You get to speak over them their failure with this phrase, checkmate. Checkmate. Once... You say checkmate, there is no escape. Once you say checkmate, it literally means the game is over. You're terminated, you're done, you're finished. One definition literally means the king is dead. Checkmate. You know, someone asked one time, what is chess? What is chess? And a chess master responded, what is life? There's something about the game of chess that represents so much of our lives. And at major chess tournaments, they actually have a painting that's normally always there, and it's the painting of this. It depicts, to the left, the painter wanted to depict the devil, the enemy. As you can see, he has a red feather. And the person to the right is kind of your average Joe from League City. And he's, he's sitting there, and you can see the man on the right. You can see he's frustrated. You can see it looks like the devil has uh, outsmarted him. The devil has advanced on him. And he's in this place where he's lost. It's over. It's done. Hence the title of this painting, Checkmate. Checkmate. And see, this is how the enemy wants us to live our lives. The enemy wants us to live our lives in this place of feeling like it's over, it's done, there's no hope for you, it's over, it's finished, you're a failure. Yes, yes, you made a mistake, you are a mistake. The devil loves to just say checkmate over God's people. And when I read this story about the Egyptians, here they are, they're thinking that they're stepping into the promise of God. They can finally dream again. They're not slaves anymore. They're totally free. 
And they're on their way. And suddenly they get word, oh no, here comes the enemy. And so they're starting to run and they get to the edge of the Red Sea. Well, obviously they can't go across the sea, millions of people. And so they look and they think to themselves, checkmate. And they look to their right and they see a mountain range. And they're thinking, well, we can't go here, checkmate. And they look to their left and they're thinking, well, I can't go there, checkmate. And they look behind and they see all these warriors and chariots coming after them. And they're thinking, checkmate, we're done, we're finished. Moses, why did you bring us here? Moses, you don't understand what you're doing. Moses, it's, it's over, man. Don't you get it? And there are many people in this room, I know, and many people in Overflow that are watching right now, that I don't know what's happened to you this year. But I believe, and I know well enough to know, that some of you have had to sit across from a doctor, and maybe they were talking to you. Maybe they were talking to your dad. Maybe they were talking to your son or your daughter. And you hear the doctor saying these words about how they have this or they have that, and there's nothing we can do, and there's, there's, no, there's no other way to go, and this is going to be your life now. And anything that you say, it just feels like the doctors are saying, Checkmate. Checkmate. It's over for you. The life you thought, the dream you thought you had, it's checkmate for you. For some of you, maybe this past year, or even right now, you're going through a horrific divorce and this person that you looked across from and you said, I love you and I do till death do us part. Now you sit across and you both have lawyers next to you and you, you hate each other and, and the dream that you had for your kids, it was going to be a dream. It, the kids, it was going to be this. We were supposed to be the picture-perfect family, and now that's all ruined. It's checkmate. For some, you wake up every morning, and you don't know why you feel this way, but you wake up, and you just feel like, man, what am I even doing anymore? Why am I even on this earth? I'm not adding anything to anyone's life. It would just be better if I just weren't here. Checkmate. For some of you, maybe you're a young girl and you are pregnant and you don't want to tell anybody because you're ashamed and you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what you're going to do. You feel like you've thrown your entire life away and the enemy has surrounded you and whispered in your ear, checkmate. So many people, so many people live this life where they feel like it's checkmate for them. You feel like it's done. You feel like it's over. You're right, Pastor. I made a mistake, but more importantly, I am a mistake. But what I love about this painting, I'm going to have him throw it up again is that during one chess match, go ahead and throw the painting up again, one, a chess master pulled up the painting again. <laughs> <laughs> and he stood up in the middle of his chess match after studying the, the painting, and he said, it's not true! And everyone just stopped playing. And he said, look! And he pointed to the white pieces. He pointed to the man that looks like he's lost. And he said, look! The king has one more move. It's not checkmate. Easter is the announcement over your situation that it's not checkmate for you. The king has one more move in your life. You're not surrounded. It's not over for the believer. Your destiny is not defeat. That is not the destiny of a believer. We have to understand that when God's people are surrounded, God knows how to find a path. God knows how to find a way. God knows how to show you a way out of your circumstance and out of your situation. 
And Easter is the announcement that no matter what the enemy is whispering in your ear, it's over, it's over, it's over. I'm sorry. But the announcement of Jesus is that the king always has one more move. See, we have to understand this because Moses and the Israelites, they're at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's coming. He's, they, they have nowhere to go. And, and, and all of a sudden, Moses, the pastor, he's just like, you know what, guys? It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Quit your whining. Quit your complaining. Just be quiet. And he takes out that staff, that old staff, and he slams it into the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, we know the story. The Red Sea parts, and God makes a way. God makes, God makes a way for them to walk through. And then what happens is this. God lets the sea swallow up their enemies. Because the king always has one more move. And most people live their life defeated. And you know what? I completely understand why. Because the enemy comes in our lives as a condemning spirit. A condemner. Now, I don't want this to get twisted because this is what the enemy does in this time. The enemy is wicked. Do you know what wickedness is, where that word comes from? Wickedness. It's like a candle. A candle has a wick, and it's normally three uh, strings, and you twist them together. So wickedness is a truth wrapped in two lies. Make sense? So the enemy comes to condemn you. And I don't know who in here has been in, on trial before, or you've had a prosecuting attorney. Has that ever happened to anybody where you had a prosecuting attorney? Don't raise your hand. We, there might still be a warrant out for your arrest. <laughs> but I have been arrested. <laughs> Why am I here? Who are you? Uh, um, we were doing it for Jesus. We may or may not have jumped over a barbed wire fence to film something for the Lord and accidentally got arrested for criminal trespass. <laughs> this is true. And well, because where we were, it was citizens arrest. So we were filming something for church and the person that owned the land was like, I want them arrested. So the cops were like, dude, I'm sorry. I have to arrest you. Take the rings off, handcuffs, go into the holding cell Yes, me, my wife, my pastor, all of us in jail. Kate's got to go to the women's jail. So I'm just chilling, you know, in jail. And then when Kate, here's what's so funny. When Kate got out of jail, I mean, she's in there with prostitutes, women that just, you know, beat somebody up on the side of the road on a Friday night. And Kate is leaving her jail cell. I see her be like, bye, girl, see you later, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what's going on? And Kate's like, these are my new friends. You know, we just met. And I'm like, we're talking about Jesus. And I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. And so it was like this really funny thing. But you know what wasn't funny? When we went to trial. Like, it totally went, we're like, it's going to get thrown out. Everyone tells you, which, by the way, if anything happens to you legally, don't listen to anyone else. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> It'll get thrown out. It didn't. <laughs> we went to trial, and oh, you should have seen the prosecuting attorney. He was a short dude. <laughs> and he was just like, he was like, these are pastors. They know better. And you're sitting there like, oh, no. Because the maximum sentence was 30 days in jail. He's like, I, I would give them 30 days in jail. Just to show an example, they think that God's on their side because God's on their side. They can do anything that they want. Well, we're here to tell you, sir, that there's laws in this country. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, oh I'm evil. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just nothing. And like, I'll just never forget how it felt, how out of control it feels when someone is just sitting there condemning you. You knew better. You know, you should have been. You always, and, and this is what the enemy does. Do you understand that the enemy loves to surround you? Whenever I'm working out, you know what's so funny? I'll go to a workout or I'll get my hair cut or whatever, and, and, and I never want to tell people what I do. You know why? Because here's what they do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I cussed, and I'm sorry I, you know, I apologize, you know. Amen. And how great thou art, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, please stop, stop. Because you don't understand how God is. 
You think that God is the condemner. So when you don't show up to church, when you do things that you know you shouldn't do, when you do all those things, you think that that's a condemning thing. Can I just help you out? That is the enemy condemning you to keep you away from God's house. If I go in that church, it's going to burn down. If I go in there, if God knew, people knew what I did, I'll tell you what. But if you want to know what God's like, you have to look to the logo of God. The logo of God, the logos of God is Jesus Christ. So you have to look at how Jesus treated people to understand how God feels about you. But most people think, and the devil loves to let you think, that what you've done You deserve punishment. You deserve this. You deserve the shame. You deserve the guilt. See, you're sick. You know why you're sick? Because you haven't been to church. You know why your kid's going crazy? Is because you've just been disobeying God. And I'm just here to tell you, that's a checkmate lie. Now Now here's the wickedness in it. Conviction is different. God convicts you. Conviction looks like this. The Holy Spirit comes on you. And you say, God, I love you, and I need to be better in this area of my life. There's, there's a warmth to it. There's a, there's a father, there's a father, there's a, there's a father's hand on it. Does that make sense? You know when a father comes up and a son's diso- disobeying and a father's like, son, let me talk to you. Right? There's, there's a warmth to it. And so what the enemy does is he tries to act like conviction and condemnation are the same. But God's word says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So if you believe the checkmate lie, can I just help you with how Jesus treats people who feel like they're in checkmate? I think of the young girl that's been caught in adultery and they they get her, they throw her at the feet of Jesus and say, she was caught in adultery. What do you have to say now, Jesus? And they're right about it. But one of the worst places you can throw a sinner to punish them is at the feet of Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He dips down to that young girl and he says, get up. He says, put your rocks down surrounding this girl. Put your rocks down. And he says, I don't condemn you. He says, just go and sin no more. And he releases her. That's how God feels about you. You're down. You're like, give me the stones. Give me the stones. He's like, get up. Stop. Stop it. I feel like that's the number one thing that God kind of says to us a lot of times. Stop it. Stop it. You can't do this on your own. You can't. Jesus wants to come into your situation. You know what he told that girl? Just like Moses' staff came in and said, good, and created a path. Those people surrounded that girl. You know what Jesus came in and did? He created a path for her to walk free. She was surrounded. It was over her. She was going to die. And Jesus came in and said, nope, go, you're free. And for the believer, it's true for you as well. Because you don't understand the Easter message of the king has one more move. It's not over. It's not finished. You're not done. God's not done with you. You know why? Breathe in. (gasps) Breathe out. (sighs) There's proof. God's not done. He's He's not done with you. You're in church. You made it. The enemy's like, you shouldn't be here. See, the condemner. But God's like, I'm so glad you're here. I'm not done with you. Because the enemy always loves to make us feel like it's over. But I love college football. I don't know if you love college football. Love college football. And, um, and uh, I feel bad that the Buckeyes lost to Bama, but whatever. And, um, but one of the greatest endings in college football history I love, and I want to show this to you. Let's take a look. Harmon will probably try to squib it, and he does. Ball comes loose, and the Bears have to get out of bounds. Rodgers along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rodgers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. Oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going to go into the Bears. The Bears have won. The Bears. 
Spurs have won! Oh my God! The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, heart-rending, exciting, thrilling finish in the history. Pentecostal preacher right there, ladies and gentlemen. And, um, you know, I, I, I look at that, and when I see that, I'm like, what was the band doing out on the field? <laughs> this is what the enemy does to us in our life. He loves to take the band out on the field, play the song, it's over, you wake up. You already feel like a failure. Why? It makes no sense because it's the enemy's song. Makes you remember your past, what you did, what you said. He loves to play that song. It's over. Play the song. Play the song because he wants to distract you from the fact that the king always has one more move. It's not over till it's over. It's not over till you're in that grave. And so if you're alive, can I just tell you it's a testimony that the devil lost. Can I just let you know that the scars in your life, maybe physically or even mentally, those are proof that the devil didn't win. Jesus' scars on his hands when he came into his resurrected body was proof. Look, Thomas, touch it. The devil lost. And the same is true for you in your life. God does not want you to be down. God does not want you to feel like you're, you, you have no other choice. God does not want you to feel like, like, like just because you made a mistake, you, you listen, just because you made a mistake, you are not a mistake. You have to understand that the king always has one more move. I don't know if you need to write it on a post-it note and put it up in your bathroom on the mirror or put it on your dashboard or put it in your phone till at 6 a.m. every day you wake up and it says the king has one more move. I'll never forget sitting across from doctors when they said my daughter would never eat or my daughter would never be able to talk or sing. And I'll never forget in that moment, I just felt so dark. I felt so confused. And I'll never, I'll never forget my wife just speaking up in the middle of that saying, I appreciate what you're saying. And through tears saying, she will eat, she will speak, and she will sing. And every single night, you know, we sing to, to my, to, she says, sing Jesus. And we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And her, her precious little voice, which you'll hear, she sings, Jesus loves me. Yes. All right? So doctors can say whatever they want to say. I'm not mad at them. I believe that God has given us doctors. But there are some times where you have to have an anointed no. Yeah. No. Yeah, sure. Nope. Sorry. My king has one more move, and you're going to see. You're going to see. Listen, God's not done with your marriage. God's not done with you. God is not done in your life. God is not, it's not over for you. God has so much more for you. The attacks on your life are proof of the power that God has put on the inside of you. The king has one more move. I think about Jesus, and they took him, and they lashed him 39 times with a cat of nine tails. It had jagged glass and jagged bone on it. They put him on that whipping post and they whipped his back and it was sticky. It had a stickiness to it so that when the, the, the glass and the bone stuck into his back, it would rip chunks of flesh out. And they whipped him 39 times and they, 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 they threw him on the floor and they put a crown of thorns on his head and they put a cross on his back and they made him walk down the street called the Via De La Rosa. And there were people mocking him as he carried his cross, making fun of him, taking cheap shots at him. They were, they, were, uh, they were pulling his beard hairs out and they were spitting on him. They were mocking him. And he got so intense that Jesus dropped his cross and they pulled a man from the crowd out. His name was Simon. And Simon started to carry Jesus' cross. However, I don't believe that Simon carried Jesus' cross. I believe that Jesus was carrying Simon's cross. Jesus was carrying Herod's cross and Pilate's cross and Judas's cross and the thief one on the left, the thief, thief two on the right's cross. It was their cross. It was every liar. It was every adulterer. It was every cheater. It was... It was Every hater, 
It was your cross. And it was my cross. The Bible says he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities and the chastisement of my well-being. He took upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And so they would take that cross to the hill of Golgotha and they would put him up on that cross. He would breathe his last breath. He would die a horrible, gruesome public death. And at exactly three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun eclipsed, the earth became dark and the earth began to tremble and shake. And hell was saying, checkmate. Hell was saying, checkmate. And they took him off that cross. They put him in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And, they, and, the, and the, the enemy rolled a stone in front of it. And hell just threw a big old party. Popping bottles, checkmate. Day one went by. Day two went by. Checkmate, checkmate. But on the third day, two women approached the tomb. And they were surprised because the stone was rolled away. The guard had fled for their lives. And an angel is sitting on top of the stone. And he says, who are you looking for? You can come in if you want to and see the place where the Lord laid. But he is risen just as he said. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a resurrected Savior which comes to you now and lets you know the king always has one more move. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not over for you. God's not done with you. God, many people think that this is God's posture. Get him. I can't wait to catch him. But this is God's posture to you. Come on. Come on. We're going to fix that area. Come on. We're going to fix that marriage. Hey, hey, wipe your tears. It's going to be all right. We're going to fix this. You know what I've always felt? That the Spirit of God is like this. You know when you have like the worst dream ever and you wake up, like you do something horrible in your dream and you're like, oh my gosh, this is like awful. And then you wake up and you're like, it's just a dream. I didn't do it. Oh, wow. Wow. People have got to be better at receiving forgiveness and the righteousness. You put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, okay? You put on, no matter how guilty you feel, condemnation. You have to learn to wake up and say, I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. When you wake up and say, even if you've accepted Jesus, you're like, I'm a failure. I fail God every day. I, I fail God every day. You need to tell yourself to shut up. And say, I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. That's my past. That's who I was. But I I am now walking in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. You have to learn to do that. Or otherwise, you're going to live your whole life feeling like it's checkmate. Jesus came, his first sermon. You know what he said? This is his first sermon. I have come to set the captives free. And many of you, you're like, the, you're, like the, you're like, you're just like God's people. It's better if we're just it's, just, it's just better if I'm captive. It's just better if I go back. It's just better. It just feels better. No, it actually doesn't. You know how God wants you to live your life? Light, airy, joyful, free. The issue comes when you think that your suffering adds to the cross. Right? You think that me, I got to punish myself and then somehow it appeases God. No, God's already been appeased through Jesus. God's good. God's good to go. Now you just have to accept Jesus and any suffering that you put upon yourself is worthless. I just, I'm just going to help you. It doesn't mean anything to God because Jesus already, he already did it for you. You have nothing to accomplish. It's not what you do, do, do. It's what's been done, done, done on the cross. Do you hear what I'm saying? Most people are like, well, I got to get good. Pastor, you know, I'm going to get good. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do really good things. No, you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. Okay? So quit. Get that out of your mind. Get that. Well, well, you know, I'm going to probably sin again. And I'm probably, yeah, I know. What's God going to tell you? I'll still be here. That's why we have church services every week. Because we know. What is life? 
And you're, some weeks you're going to need to be reminded in a small group, through Summit, through your pastor. Hey, come here. Get your head up. King has one more move. So bring your doctor's reports. Bring your shame. Bring all that guilt you have. God can take it. And God can make a way, just like he made a way for the girl caught in adultery, just like he made a way for the man that was struggling with depression in the graveyard. He still makes a way for every person that believes the checkmate lie. Every eye closed, every head bowed. You're here today and you're not right with God. You know you're not right with God. Again, this is not condemnation. This is conviction. You just know like, you know, I'm just, I'm not living for God, pastor. I'm just, I know I'm not right with God and I just, I don't know. I want to be better. God loves you. God's not mad at you. Man, the logos of God, Jesus showed us in every way that he cared for humanity. God cares for you. He cares for you. He sees your situation and he is begging for you to accept him in your life. But you have to make a decision to say, yes, I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna go all in. I'm doing this. I'm gonna declare Jesus is the Lord of my life. And the Bible says in Romans, when you declare him with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and he rose again for your sins, that you are saved. So why would you live one more second of life? Striving, trying, No, no, stop it, stop it. His presence is here. You say yes to him. He's gonna help you figure it out. You're here. You say, that's me. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise up your hand boldly, boldly. Why? You say why? Because a decision has to be made and you have to let God know, I'm not playing games anymore. I'm here for you, Lord. So on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise up your hand in the overflow as well. One, two, three. Three, just raise up your hand in this room. Hands going up. Please keep your hand up. Please keep your hand up quickly. No one's looking around. Please keep your hand up. I'm going to have a friend put a card in your hand. You'll know to put your hand down when you get a card in your hand. Please keep your hand up. Many, 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 many hands. Many hands. Just get that card quickly, quickly. Quickly, just keep your hand up. You'll know to put your hand down when you get a card in your hand. Right here, Greg. Right here. And right over here, guys. Right over here. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For those of you that raised your hand, I'd like you to put one hand over your heart. Ah, it's not checkmate for you. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and for my shame. I believe that you rose again from the dead, defeated death, hell, and the grave for me. I ask that you wash me, cleanse me, give me a brand new beginning and a brand new start. I believe that the king always has one more move in my life. Very quickly, because many hands went up. I need all eyes up here really quick. And I just, one minute, I'm going to give you instruction quickly. Number one, if you raise your hand, give God one year of your life. Watch what God can do in one year of your life. Come in through the doors of the church. You're going to sometimes feel like the biggest failure. You're going to feel like the biggest sinner. But the greatest place to be when you feel like a loser and you feel like a checkmate on your life is to be in God's house, okay? Be here, jump into summit, jump into small groups. You say, I don't understand all that. Jump in. And one Easter from now, you're going to be a completely different person. Number two, There's going to be some friends that don't understand the decision that you made. They're going to be like, you're a God person now. You're a, don't fight with them, love them, pray for them. But you don't let anything come in between you and your relationship with God. That's number one. And number three, this marks a brand new beginning in your life. The Bible is clear that old things pass away and behold, all things have become new. So what this means is when Jesus went in the grave, so did your sin. Does that make sense? It's over. Why would you hang out in the graveyard? The enemy's going to try to play the tape, play the song. Stop. You put on the righteousness of Christ Jesus. 
I'm out of here. God's made a way. The king has one more move. And I'm moving into the dream and the destiny that God has in my life. So keep your head high. God loves you. He's for you. And I want to give a big hand clap to those that made the decision today to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Well, let's stand to our feet together. So many eggs. We love you guys. You guys are going to have fun to get eggs with your kids. Don't forget baptisms next weekend. Holy Spirit series. Come on the journey with us. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The king always has one more move. Love you guys. See you guys next week.